Nord Stream 2 and European energy security, lessons learned. And perhaps there is a lot of lessons to be learned. And we have some people with us today who I think will give us a, an extremely good and rowdy view of what those lessons may be. So uh, um, immediately to my right is the former distinguished foreign minister of Lithuania, Linus Lenovexus. Then the Under Secretary of State uh, in the Polish Foreign Ministry, Marcin, and I apologize, I'm probably going to get your own right, name, surname wrong now, Podash. Yes, Shivas, okay. And uh, the well known and distinguished uh, German MEP, Richard Botoffer. The end. Thank you very much. And meanwhile, online, we have uh, General McMaster, the uh, former US National Security Advisor. And Ola Stavakaska, who is the, the, um, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister for Euro Atlantic Integration in Ukraine, uh, calling in from Kiev. So I think, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have got a, a really interesting question. And, and perhaps we could start with, uh, with uh, 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 discussing simply the, the, the question to do with uh, some of the lessons to be learned. Does this raise really a question about gas? Is gas a balancing fuel, uh, a, a, a national security threat? Do we need to move into a different, different energies? Or do we actually uh, need to think about whose gas we're using? Uh, Who would like to start? Yeah, thank you. Indeed, as you said, a uh, very interesting question. But at the same time, I'm looking that at this conference, I'm very critical. I'd like to be nice always, but always uh, no reason to be nice and no reason to be complacent because basically also answering to your questions We're not very smart in lessons learned. We're not learning lessons. Maybe lessons too difficult or maybe we are not smart enough That's the, the issue and when it comes to Nord Stream 2 uh, it looks like technical uh, project but it's becoming so political and geopolitical that we cannot avoid uh, making some conclusions here and unfortunately this is a matter of credibility matter of trust, when we're agreeing on some policies, we must implement, we must be consistent. If not, we're undermining trust, credibility, and making uh, ourselves more vulnerable at the same time. So this is really the case. Because we agreed on energy uh, policy, European Union energy policy, we agreed that we have to diminish uh, dependence on one source, we have to diversify our supplies, and we're doing vice versa, in, in short. Also politically punishing Ukraine. Uh, you can deny that, but this is obvious. And by the way, when we are talking about uh, kind of uh, mitigations and possibility how to, how, to, how to diminish all this possible damage, uh, this is uh, becoming also very difficult because we, what we can see now, uh, again, we're not, uh, we're not experts of energy, but uh, we, uh, everybody knows that energy crisis is approaching. A gas price is coming up and uh, contracts, uh, prices of contracts also reached uh, heights. And at the same time, uh, su supply of, of gas from Russia uh, diminishing. And uh, quite recently, 24% uh, less uh, supplies to Europe. Uh, uh, what, what, what that means, it's an our question. So many experts saying that this is kind of pressure to accomplish all procedures with Nord Stream 2. Yeah. This is maybe the reason. Uh, and I would say here, in short, because we have not too much time probably yeah, yeah. for elaborations, but I would predict there are three, three phases now here. First phase, uh, to be reliable supplier, I mean, in terms of Russia, definitely they will fulfill all commitments, and uh, that's uh, for the reason to, to start uh, the oper operational Nord Stream 2. Second uh, phase will be strengthening these positions. And third phase, uh, phase will be kind of uh, political manipulation, but they are very smart to, 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 to do and very smart to be, unfortunately. You cannot deny that. And then price will be defined not by technical or, or, or economic uh, kind of um, leverages, but by political de de decisions. And here it comes, maybe finally, it's not just energy. Uh, my point is that we are usually lagging behind in our policies. We are reacting rather than being proactive. We're not just undermining our agreed uh, uh, policies, but sometimes definitely we're not uh, doing things on time and doing sufficiently. And it has to do with all hybrid threats, not just energy security. It has to do with strategic communications, it has to do with the cyber security. 
And it happens that our country, my country, and Baltic region, and also, also Poland, I believe to some extent, we are exposed to the front lines of these threats. So we're learning these threats not from the books, but from real life. And here is uh, the conclusion that the lessons are not, not learned. Yes, uh, Monson, I wonder if there is a, a, le a, 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 a lesson for Europe from uh, the Polish um, uh, policies over the last few years. Because in many ways, Poland has been proactive in the sense that you know, you've got the Baltic pipeline coming on stream, you've enhanced the amount of uh, gas uh, capacity of Swinuski. So there is a kind of uh, uh, a Polish proactivity. And do you think this is something which you should really, as a lesson should be learned from Nord Stream 2, that we need to take a proactive or Polish approach at European level? Well, thank you very much for um, having me and thank, thank you for this um, interesting um, um, conversation. I fully share Mr. Linkiewicz's point. I mean, there, there are no, um, um, we, have, we haven't learned from the previous lessons. We haven't learned from the aggressive steps taken by Russia in Georgia in 2008. We haven't learned from the aggressive steps uh, taken uh, by Russia in, in Ukraine. And I think we haven't learned that much from the uh, uh, Russian steps taken uh, with the instrument of um, um, energy security. I mean, it was the, uh, the case of Ukraine, it was the case of Belarus a couple of years ago when they were somehow blocked with the uh, <coughs> energy resources coming from Russia. Russia that just uses energy as a political instrument to get uh, um, the political, to achieve the political goals they wanted to do, to, to, to do it. Should we, as the European Union, as NATO, as the Western community, allow them to do it? Should we help them to do it, to give them more uh, opportunities to use it as a uh, political instrument? In my opinion, and not only mine, we shouldn't. But somehow, not we, but they've done it. I mean, the, 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 uh, the, the, the fact that uh, um, Nord Stream 2 is an uh, almost done project, uh, worse than this, the, and the, the, the security situation in the region. We shouldn't talk only about the energy security, no. but the, in a wider, in a wider um, uh, concept, in, in a wider context. Well, um, uh, when it comes to the energy security, as you said, I mean, we've, uh, as Poland, we were quite prepared to this. I mean, we've built the uh, LNG terminal, we've, we've built the Baltic pipe, our Lithuanian colleagues, colleagues they do also have a LNG um, a terminal uh, in order not to be blackmailed by um, our uh, Russian uh, partners, because I dare to say that Russia is not a credible partner, not a political one, but also in terms of the um, energy um, uh, security. That's why we need to be prepared, and we are here in, the, in, in Europe, uh, we are trying to be um, yeah, prepared. Poland is ready to be not only the consumer of the energy security, but the provider of the, the energy security for um, um, its neighbors uh, through the infrastructure we have, but through the also political fora, political organizations we are uh, um, a part of, including, of course, the EU, but the, uh, the newly appointed, somehow, the, the Three Cs um, um, initiative. This is the forum also to discuss the energy um, um, security, but as I, uh, as I said at the very beginning, it should be seen in the wider strategic con con uh, context. Um, uh, Nord Stream 2, the, 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 the uh, outcome of this decision is the lack of security in, um, in, in not only in the region, but in the, uh, on the whole um, um, the continent, and we should somehow react to that. This deficit of um, the security will be the fact uh, sooner than uh, later. So we do believe that uh, uh, the, the, this situation clearly needs to be um, uh, addressed by the, by the Western community, uh, including within the, the, the NATO in its economic, political, and security um, aspects. The, the element of such uh, reaction, of such response, should um, include sending clear political message that there is no return to business as usual with Russia, um, enhancing the resilience of the affected countries first, of course, on the eastern flank of, of Europe, uh, but also Ukraine, mm -hmm. and taking concrete actions to further strengthen the deterrence and defense of the eastern flank of NATO, since we all, I believe, agree that it can be used as the political uh, instrument. Even in the German-American uh, agreement, it's, it's 
it's, it, it clearly says that it may be uh, weaponized, it, can, it may be used as a political instrument, then we need to respond to that, we need to react somehow. Um, uh, and that, that, that's our position, uh, that we need more NATO presence uh, 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 down here in the uh, region and, uh, and the clear political signals towards Russia that there will be no uh, business uh, as usual. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I wonder, Richard, do you think the part of the energy security solution here is, is indeed to look at a lot of uh, alternative and renewable energies as part of the supply security uh, response, the proactive response to uh, the uh, development and establishment of Nord Stream 2? First of all, thanks for having me here. It's a really important conversation we're having. Uh, and I do regret that the project has uh, matured so much. Um, but indeed, the learning space that we uh, have in front of us is multidimensional. And one of the dimensions is, as you say, Alan, that uh, we we should learn from this Nord Stream 2 experience, as we could have learned also before that, yeah. that renewable energies, new energy solutions, do not only contribute to energy security or to climate policy, they also have a very fundamental geopolitical implication. If you develop your own energy generation on the basis of domestic technologies, obviously, you will not be as dependent as we already are or increasingly might be by relying on this newly built fossil energy infrastructure. So there is certainly also a security dimension to that. And, but I, I would like to add two more points uh, regarding your question about the learnings mm. that so far, I'm afraid, have not really um, taken hold that much. Uh, one is there is no such thing as a clear distinction between an economic rationale, a business case on one hand, and a geopolitical issue on the other. We know that this one very powerful person in Berlin has consistently argued that uh, this is just a business issue. I think the truth of the matter is it never has been, and an issue of that character couldn't be because even if we, it would have been started on the basis of business rationale, which it wasn't, even then it could be weaponized, as the deputy minister has said. So, so clearly this distinction is old-fashioned. We have to get rid of that. And the, the third element that where well, I think we, we really urgently must learn is how we deal with each other in, in, in Europe. I, one of my strong criticisms of this project is, uh, apart from the uh, environmental and the climate dimension and the geopolitical dimension, also it is a divisive issue within the EU. It puts neighbors against each other. And there's a lot of talk over the last years in Brussels and Paris and, and, and other capitals about strategic autonomy for the EU. I would be happy if we would talk more about strategic solidarity, which has been missing in this case. Yeah, I think that's a very profound and, and, and uh, significant point. Now, perhaps turning to Ola in, uh, in Kiev, um, obviously there is a very substantial Ukrainian angle to uh, the question as, uh, that we're discussing here. Um, a lot of the time it's um, uh, talked about from outside Ukraine as, as, as the Ukrainians losing transit fees. But you know, uh, perhaps it, we should look at it the other way. One of the lessons learned from Nord Stream 2 is the extent to which, um, in fact, Ukraine is a deliverer of uh, supply security in terms of storage and transit 
to the European Union. Uh, and, and Nord Stream 2 puts that at risk. Uh, that's the argument. Um, perhaps you could give us a kind of Ukrainian Kiev perspective on, uh, on the lessons now uh, to be learned. Thank you so much, indeed, a very, uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, and uh, of course, I will bring on the table some figures which would make, uh, bring some more clarity about that. But for Ukraine, it's uh, uh, Russia is the lesson we have been learning not only with the uh, with the experience of having Nord Stream, it's uh, Nord Stream Two is the uh, uh, unfortunate lessons we've been learning from the hybrid warfare since 2014 and many centuries before. So uh, the strategy of Russian Federation towards uh, um, proceeding and using the new gas pipeline as the weapon of hybrid war and the uh, weapon of political manipulation has been clear from you, for Ukraine from the very beginning. So, uh, and um, having... Uh, uh, having analyzed not only Ukrainian, but all European experience over the last 20 years, it is absolutely clear that uh, the Nord Stream 2 is the most ambitious geopolitical project of the Russian Federation, because over the last 20 years, Russia has deliberately, persistently and permanently subjected uh, many European countries like Latvia, Estonia, like Czechia, uh, like Ukraine, Georgia, and even Belarus to different types of blackmailing through gas manipulations and cutting gas. So now Nord Stream 2 is the most ambitious project which covers whole continent and Europe. So Russia has not now uh, the necessity to uh, work individually. Uh, it is intense to cover the, uh, the with its hybrid warfare, the whole continental Europe at once. So uh, now it is also clear for us that Ukraine, as well as European Union, are the battlefield. Uh, and uh, by deliberately uh, decreasing the gas transit to Europe, uh, Gazprom has driven energy prices up. Uh, and uh, the surge in gas prices is nothing more than Gazprom's blackmail to enforce uh, the launch of the, its political project Nord Stream 2. So, again, the whole Europe and each and every capital and in Brussels, uh, the discussion is taking place about uh, uh, increasing in, in significant increase of prices. And again, we see that there is no economic logic about that. Uh, just to give you some figures about like political and geopolitical and hybrid background of this price decrease, that Ukrainian gas transmission system has an annual capacity of more than 140 billion cubic meters to transit directly to European Union countries. Of that capacity, for this year, Gazprom booked only more than 40 billion uh, cubic meters uh, in 2021, so it's three times less than the capacity, the actual capacity of Ukrainian gas stream system, gas transit system. So, uh, which shows that there is no economic background again in this story. So, despite the available capacity, record gas pr uh, production in the Russia uh, has this summer, and the recent surge in the European gas prices, Gazprom has recently indicated that additional gas only will flow to Europe through Nord Stream 2. Again, Russia is not talking about specific capitals. They are talking about blackmailing the Europe as a whole. Um, Colleagues and uh, previous speakers were referring to the necessity to establish the new energy uh, strategy. And here I recollect in my memory the uh, very simple sentence from uh, the very simple sentence from the uh, strategy of uh, national energy security of Russian Federation, which expires uh, expired last year. Uh, it stated that Russia has significant reserves of energy resources as well as a powerful pure and energy complex which makes it the basis for economic development and the instrument for domestic and foreign policy. The country's role in wood energy markets largely de de determines ge the geopolitical influence. So this is the quotation from the National Strategy for Energy Security of the Russian Federation, which has been successfully implemented, as we see now, by the experience of the Nord Stream 2. 
Uh, so it is clear for all of us and for Ukraine that we're approaching a decisive battle for the energy security for the whole Europe. Uh, uh, the words that energy cannot be used as a weapon should be backed up with the concrete actions. Now we see the, the recent uh, gas deal between the Gazprom and the Hungarian uh, gas company, uh, one of the conditions of which are uh, stopping and cutting gas supplies to Ukraine. Uh, and this contract has been concluded by market and uh, justified prices, by extremely low prices. So it is now interesting for Ukraine to hear from German and American partners where do they see the red lines where the economic project, as it is called in these capitals, turns out to be a geopolitical. For us, these red lines have already been far crossed. So, and let me bring um, a bit of different context also to this discussion, because just in, in uh, less than one week in Kiev, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky will host the next uh, Ukraine-EU summit with the uh, President of the European Commission and President of the European Council. And one of the key discussions on this summit will be targeted to discuss the necessity to launch the whole European energy security debates to make sure that all European capitals and all member states are clear, uh, clearly facing the threats uh, affected by the uh, new gas war launched by Russian Federation. And given the fact that Russia is targeted to cover the whole continental Europe, it's, it's important that the whole European response and resilience shall, shall be built. It is very important that Ukraine is, considers itself one of the most energy resilient nations because from the very beginning we didn't have any over expectations for Russia. We didn't have our rose glasses saying that there is a, some economic background in this project because A, we have been subjected to energy blackmailing and gas blackmailing for, uh, for the last 30 years. We saw how that was happening in Latvia back in 2023 in Belarus in 2004 and 26, uh, and 2006, in, in Georgia, in, um, uh, in Kazakhstan, Czech Republic, and Estonia. So this is like a not a new experience. And uh, uh, it's very important that EU uh, will play a key role here, both when it comes to certification, uh, 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 conclusion on the certification of the uh, Nord Stream 2, uh, when it comes to uh, conclusions whether this project is in line with the third energy packet. Uh, and it is particularly important for Ukraine because Ukraine has spent last 10 years in aligning its rules of the gas market with the European rules. And we have gone through the un uh, ownership unbundling, third party access grant uh, grant guarantees, transparent market rules, cost effective tariffs formation. This is the Europe we trusted in. This is the rules of the market we believe in, and this is the rules we ensured in our market to become part of the European gas and energy family. And it is very important for us that the same approach will be applied to everybody. So uh, now we see that the role of the European Union uh, is absolutely crucial here to make sure that not only um, uh, energy security uh, and national security is preserved uh, for Ukraine, but that all member states who are um, so still committed to European values and principles are protected and safeguarded and resilient in the face of this new threat. So, and the third, um, the very last point from my side, that uh, we hope that the proposal for Ukraine to start the strategic discussions on energy security will be considered and supported by European Union and its member states. The main lesson learned, as you, uh, respective moderator, were referring, from the Nord Stream 2 and the whole hybrid warfare we experienced, is that Europe is still about to develop an inclusive but unified approach to energy security. There were some unilateral actions, however, which has brought little of trust uh, to, uh, to that as we see it right now. I believe that the European Union, together with partners like Ukraine, should start working on, on the new vision of the energy resilience 
Uh, we have launched the same discourse uh, in NATO um, at the platform of discussions related to the new hybrid warfare threats, and energy security is subject to one of that. So uh, I believe that we should stay clear in understanding that by undermining the Ukrainian gas transportation system, the Ukrainian whole way through to European integration in the energy sector over the last year, 10 years, Russia weakens not only Ukraine economically, but it leaves us the way open for further military aggression by isolating Ukraine from the European market. Hola. It's an issue of the national survivor for us, and we cannot accept any assurances, and uh, we cannot accept any moving forward with the red lines. Ola, that's very great. Um, um, that's a very comprehensive so view of the, uh, of, the, of the Ukrainian position, for which we're tremendously thankful. And I think the point about military aggression is, is really important as a, 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 as a potential consequence of the coming into operation of Nord Stream 2, if that happens. I would now look, like to turn to General McMaster, because there is a, obviously the real part of this which we've not discussed so far is the American part and the American role in this. The US has had a very significant uh, impact. As a result of sanctions in 2020 and 2021, Nord Stream 2 was actually stopped. The construction was stopped for about a year. U.S. sanctions still affect the, uh, the diameter, diameters for the, of the operation of the pipeline potentially. And the Congress may in, in be engaged uh, with further sanctions. The other question, of course, is in terms of the potential for U.S. support for European energy security. And that's perhaps one of the lessons that uh, we, we, we need to take from Nord Stream 2 about the scale and the potential of that support. So over to General McMaster. Thank you. Well, thank you. What a, what a great panel. Real pleasure to be with everybody. I'm learning a lot. But what I'd like to do is make really three points that relate to your question and that maybe amplify uh, what some of the other panelists have, have already mentioned. And I think it's along the, the lines of lessons we're not learning, three yes. of them in particular. Uh, one lesson is, hey, don't give Russia coercive power over your economy and recognize, as many of the panelists have pointed out, that Russia is, is, is using or is maintaining a campaign of what I would call disruption, uh, disinformation, denial, and dependence, right? Three D or four Ds. And, and the last of these is, is, to, is to encourage dependence on Russia uh, for energy supplies, which we know Russia will use for, for coercive purposes. And second, I think the second lesson we're not learning is, of course, that energy security is national and, and international security. And the bias has to be, as the, as the Three Cs Conference has, has advocated for for many years, on, on, on resilience. And, and I'll just give another example of, I think, U.S. policy that went awry. Uh, we we greenlighted, essentially, Nord Stream 2, while we canceled the Keystone Pipeline in, in Canada. And what that did is not only gave Russia a course of power over, over, over Germany's and Europe's economy and over Ukraine, but it also left Canada in a situation where where's Canada going to sell its, its gas and, and, and they're going to sell it to China. So we're actually, we're actually making Canada more dependent on, on the Chinese market. And I think as we look at the race to renewables, we have to also be concerned about supply chain fragility that could be interrupted based on China's race to gain a, a preponderant position of power uh, over an influence uh, over over renewables, and in, in particular, you know, solar panels and wind turbines, but also the entire supply chain, uh, including uh, in, including battery manufacturing, for example, and rare, rare earth mining uh, and, and refinement. So, to get to get directly to your question, the third lesson I think is we need a holistic approach to interconnected problems involving our security. Our energy, our energy security, but also the, the very important task we have in front, in front of us to reduce carbon emissions and to address climate change. And it's worth pointing out that the greatest reduction of man-made carbon emissions in history was by the United States based on the availability of, of cheap natural gas. So looking at natural gas as a bridge, a bridge away from, you know, from, from dirt, dirtier fossil fuels, as, as, we, as we go toward renewables, it is an important aspect of, 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 this, uh, uh, of what we ought to be focused on. But then also looking at other sources like next generation nuclear. Our, our failure to do so 
and to think that there is this just nirvana of, a, of immediately going to exclusively renewables, that just has put Germany and 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 uh, and uh, in a position of, of really a precarious uh, dependence uh, on 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 Russia for for natural gas, and and it is one of the reasons why we have this shortfall. If you look at really what Japan did, understandably after the Fukushima disaster, in in making you know, a, a rush just to, to directly toward renewables, that left them more dependent on coal and and increased co uh, carbon emissions. So I think the three lessons are: hey, don't give Russia coercive power over your economy. Uh, the second is to is to recognize economic security is national security based on Russia's sustained campaign, really, of political subversion and economic subversion against us uh, under the theory, right, that Putin can restore Russia to natural, national greatness, mainly by dragging the rest of us down and pitting us against each other and weakening our relationships. And then third, what's missing is this holistic approach to, to, to these interconnected problems of, of energy security uh, and, and, uh, and, and climate and, and the need to reduce carbon emissions. Right. Well, thank you very much, General Master. Now, I'm actually still waiting for questions. So far, my iPad tells me there are no questions, but hopefully somebody will come up with a question. Um, but in the meantime, I would, I'd like to... Richard made a really good point about the need for solidarity. And one of the really... Uh, well, as one of the lessons from Nord Stream 2. And, uh, you know, there was a letter in the Financial Times from a, t a couple of um, uh, research fellows at Bruegel, uh, I think, yesterday. And one of the proposals that they were making was to create a European strategic gas reserve in order to ensure that we didn't actually have either have super high prices, partly caused by Russian manipulation, um, and also to provide us a degree of security against any, any leverage. And would any panel think that is that perhaps one of the sort of uh, approaches we, we, we need to, to, to think about and consider now? The question is to, to, to me. Um, thank you very much for mentioning the, the solidarity because just maybe one, we are in the country of solidarity where, where the solidarity was, uh, um, was born. So we have somehow deeply in our DNA the feeling of um, solidarity and definitely there was a lack of solidarity in, in, um, uh, with regards to the energy and the security and the, and the Nord Stream too. And that is another... Unfortunately, it's a pity, but that's another um, um, lesson learned from this um, uh, discussion, that we as the, as the European Union, uh, as the one big Euro-Atlantic family, somehow failed this test of, um, uh, of um, um, solidarity. Uh, what can we do um, now? I already said at the very um, um, beginning, but uh, what we need to do is to find a way how to diversify um, the energy resources, I mean, the, 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 the way how to get the energy resources. And so far, we are deepening, and General McMaster just said it, we are deepening our dependency on the Russian um, uh, resources. That is not the thing we agreed on at the EU um, uh, level. We, I believe that we need other international actors to be involved. Um, uh, that's why through the LNG terminal we invited American um, the companies. That's why uh, we uh, have been trying to find partners in the Gulf. <laughs> to have more um, possibilities to play um, uh, this, uh, this game. Because, I mean, being more dependent on uh, Russian resources being, uh, means being more dependent on the Russian political um, will. And I'm pretty sure that our um, German friends, uh, uh, our German partners uh, who agreed on Nord Stream 2, they are fully aware of, uh, um, of, of, of this, uh, with which partner they are um, dealing um, 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 uh, with. Uh, with regard to the storage capacities, that's, uh, that's what had been um, uh, said. I believe that, uh, of course, uh, that this is the, maybe a good direction, I mean, to, uh, to work on, on, um, on that, but uh, let's face the truth. For the next 20, uh, 30 years, we will be, of course, dependent on Russian gas. Then we need to find another way where to get the um, energy from. So the green technologies uh, is the answer, and of course the nuclear power, uh, power plants. That's the decision has been taken in Poland to be less dependent on fossil fuels, to be more green, to be less dependent on, uh, on, uh, on, on gas in the years to, um, uh, to come. Right now we are in the process of uh, choosing the right partner to do that. There are several uh, the countries and companies who are 
um, uh, uh, capable to provide uh, that kind of technology. Of course, it depends on the, on the specific offer, but it depends also on the political atmosphere and the political uh, 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 context between um, uh, those, uh, I mean, the clients and the, and the uh, investors. So I do believe that uh, in the uh, months to come, we will choose the right partner and we'll start to, um, uh, that process to, 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 as I said, to be also a provider of the energy security in this um, uh, part of the world. That's great. Richard, you want to come in? I would indeed support the idea that has been put on the table by the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, that uh, we should look into creating some strategic reserves um, uh, and create the, the storage capacity for that. But um, uh, I, I would not expect by any means that this is going to be an easy solution because immediately after she had made that proposal, a number of uh, member states immediately uh, uh, voiced their um, reservations. So, and, and on the other hand, uh, some member states, including my own country, have uh, been willing to sell some storage capacity that already exists to none other than uh, Gazprom, which is also maybe um, has not been such a smart uh, uh, move. Um, so, so indeed, I think we should go in that direction, but I would insist, and there I want to contradict General McMaster's, uh, we, sh we must insist on pushing hard on um, new energy sources. Uh, the General may uh, not be happy with what I'm saying, but look, while I'm not the typical German on Nord Stream 2, I'm very much the typical German on um, the uh, renewable energies. And I don't believe a second in substituting Russian natural gas with uh, the dirty fracking gas from the US. And that's not even a plausible alternative because you're not selling it to us to a price that we could afford. You prefer to sell that to the Asians. And uh, by the way, the US government doesn't even own its own uh, fracking gas. So, I mean, let's, let's put that aside, General, I would say, and really focus on a strategic approach, uh, promoting renewables, and in that regard, I also contradict what you say, that Germany is in the woes and dependent on Russia because of our renewables policy. That's not the case. I did commission a study by the uh, Institut, um, uh, Deutsche Institut für Wirtschaftsforschung in Berlin on the level of dependency on Russian gas um, in comparison between different European member states. And it turned out that Germany is less dependent on Russian gas than most of the other countries. So it's, it's a cynical policy to sort of know that we are not that much dependent, but we allow the Russians to uh, prolong their leverage. This is what I criticize, but I would not um, condone uh, the wrong impression that Germany itself is dependent on uh, natural gas because of renewable policies. That's not the case. Right. I think I've got to give General McMaster the right of yeah, reply. Let me, just, can I, let me just respond. Let me just respond. Uh, I just didn't realize it was going so well for Germany in the area of energy security. <laughs> and I, and I, 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 didn't, you know, I, I didn't say don't go toward renewables. But I just said, hey, what we need is a holistic solutions uh, to these interconnected problems that include, you know, our race to renewables. But we have to recognize that, that in doing so, we should create other dependencies and, and, and jeopardize our energy security. Right. There are ways we can do this uh, that are holistic, that are smart uh, and, and, and that can make it a false dilemma uh, between uh, be, you know, between exclusively renewables uh, and and uh, and and, uh, and forfeiting economic growth and energy security. Right, thank you very much, uh, Linus. You want to come in? Yeah, just uh, agreeing with what was said. But look, we are talking. If you if you agree with me about consequences, 
after pressure, no storages, strategic storages, it's okay, renewables, who, who, who can deny? It's all, also important. Let's technicians to, to, to solve this problem, uh, which, is, which is really important and priority, the task. But uh, I, I, would, I would pick up on uh, General McMaster's uh, hint, hint of holistic approach. Let's uh, see bigger picture. And bigger picture is, is that uh, Russians manipulating and definitely we will maybe m mitigate these uh, consequences by technical solutions, but we are not ready to, to withstand uh, methods what they're using. Bribe bribing former European politicians for energy companies, and they, it shouldn't be tolerated, by the way, because they are still influential back in their countries somehow. Uh, also, we are lagging behind in our, in our uh, kind of uh, measures to be taken, and uh, I would put one example. Uh, we have to talk not only about, about the European Union, but also about NATO, I, I would say. Uh, when we had a uh, discussion about energy security, and I remember when I spent some time at NATO, and I had a hard time to explain to military authorities in NATO that NATO has something to do with energy security. It was before 2006. After 2006, Riga summit, it happened uh, that uh, placed in the NATO, NATO documents as a taskings, and, and now nobody's surprised, and we have center of excellence in Vilnius dealing uh, on energy security. And it happens not by accident that the other Baltic capitals, also centers of excellence, NATO centers of excellence, dealing with other hybrid threats like cyber or strategic communications. So let's see why the picture, why we are lagging behind, why it takes time to understand that we have to adjust our methods, leverages, and what we are doing in this, in this regard. So this is definitely not something we can be proud. And when solidarity was mentioned here, uh, and uh, nice word, but... Solidarity was not performed when it was needed. Now it's too late. I remember discussions uh, also in Germany uh, before the previous government was formed and the uh, coalition was different uh, planned at that time. I remember we met with the colleagues and all of them were against Nord Stream 2, as, I, as far as I remember, at that time. And now time passed and it's too late now to change something. So now to talk about solidarity is also too late. And it's good that you said Germany is not so dependent, but through Nord Stream 2, Germany will be more dependent, and through Germany, the European Union will be more dependent on, on, on single su supply from, from Russia. So unfortunately, this is, this is the result of our uh, misbehavior. Okay. That would be my, just yeah. one additional question or comment. I mean, I've just, we've just heard that Germans are, Germany are less dependent comparing to other countries. So why there if you want to be more dependent on Russian? No, uh, on Russian, not. Uh, by building and uh, complement, uh, you know, finishing up the, the Nord Stream 2, you, you will look at us. I mean, before, because of the Soviet, post-Soviet legacy and the maybe not very um, good decisions in, in, the, in the 90s, we are down here in this region very much dependent on Russian gas. And we tell you, our German partners, friends and allies, don't do that. I mean, not, of course, Look, not you, it's the government of, um, of, of Germany. So the question is, why do you want to be more dependent on Russian gas? Look, Deputy Minister, you're asking the, the wrong person. I've been, I've been fighting this pipeline since the inception. And I, I'm not willing to give up at this moment, by the way, Minister. Um, I still uh, would em emphasize that there is a need to uh, judge whether uh, the project conforms to the legal uh, yeah. provisions that we have in the European Gas Directive. And I'm not of the opinion that this is uh, living up to, to the standards that have been put in the law. We, we're going to have a, a decision by the European Court of Justice whether that uh, um, uh, law will be applied, as we hope it would, from the European Parliament. You know that the European Parliament has been a very strong voice against Nord Stream 2, uh, with a broad coalition from the Conservatives to the Greens. Um, and, and I would still hope that we can insist, uh, all of us, uh, wh wh wherever we have a little leverage, to fight this battle to the end. I, I'm not willing to give up at the moment. But you're, you're of course, right uh, when you say, why has Germany been doing that? It's not in Germany's favor. It's not in the favor of our neighbors. It doesn't create more cohesion. It's not living up to the targets and goals of European energy policy. It's a very, very blindfolded, strategically dumb policy that has unfortunately been 
um, followed by several governments, and that almost came to the conclusion now. We still hope for the better. I've got a, um, I've got a question uh, already on my iPad uh, about, uh, from Sofia Shevchuk about the US-German deal on Nord Stream 2, and particularly the impact of the EU, sorry, the, US, the German fund, the German Green Fund for Ukraine. And I don't know, does Ola have a view on that, or does anyone have a particular view? Ola, yes. Thank you. I have a very, very interesting view on that. Uh, well, but before I, um, I wanted to reflect on the previous discussion, I think that uh, it is really a very bad tendency that we're talking of this project as it is already as it has already been launched and fully implemented, and now we're discussing how to mitigate the negative consequences of this of this project. Now it is is not so. Uh, the uh, the 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 process of its legitimization is still ongoing, and for us it's the, it's the process of, of values, because basically the whole revolution of the European regulations has been built on a number of principles, which is solidarity, transparency on the market, and competition. So, and this is already confirmed by European Court of Justice as uh, in the decision as regards the Opal pipeline. So, uh, so, so having this in mind, we should have also in mind that by legitimization of this decision, we are also undermining the basic principles. So, uh, so here in Ukraine, we are absolutely not supporting the discourse related to uh, like uh, um, concentrating on mitigating the risks. So, we should concentrate ourselves on not allowing for this hybrid warfare to take place here in our territory. Okay. Uh, but now uh, the question about the, uh, the, um, uh, the green fund uh, initiated by Germany um, uh, with the amount of like 1 billion of euros. So this was uh, a very surprising uh, information for us, which we have uh, found out about uh, uh, directly in a statement uh, following the meeting of uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel and President Biden. And uh, just like a couple of days before, the Ukraine has approved the nationally determined contribution uh, under the Paris Agreement uh, on cutting the emissions, uh, where we have uh, stipulated that uh, it will require 100.2 billions of euro euros for Ukraine to ensure the green transition. Yeah. So the amount of, of the fund initiated by Germany is, seems uncomparable to, to the reality. And the whole discussion we're having here today on the Nord Stream 2, this is the first thing. Then the second thing, it was very much clear for the German side before this announcement has been done. That uh -huh. Ukraine has been, uh, uh, has self-committed itself to align its policy with European Green Deal. Hola. Hola. We, we have, uh, we have moved again the very ambitious national determined contribution. So, And we have launched already the whole discourse with the financial institutions European Commission partners to establish the financial platform. And now we see this statements as the willingness to brand the whole efforts Ukraine has already undertaken unilaterally Hola. in terms of this position Th with um, the German support. Thank you very so, much. But thank of course, we're in a dialogue with, the, with our German partners, but oh, this Ola. is the launch. Oh, oh, Ola. Th thank you very much. We have to actually stop because we have because the trouble with this subject is that we could go on for three or four hours, and I think Cassie would probably shoot me if we did that. So I realize we have to stop. This is a very interesting debate, a passionate debate, and it will go on, no, no doubt, for some time to come. Thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry we only need to take a couple of questions, but uh, I think it has been an interesting and stimulating debate. Thank you very much.